Well, good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's mission status briefing on Atlantis' flight to the International Space Station. A new addition today on the station and with us to discuss the day's events is Emily Nelson, the lead International Space Station Flight Director for STS-132 ULF-4. Emily? Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Well, today the primary focus, especially this morning, was the installation of the mini research module number one, which was brought up in Atlantis's payload bay. And it was an absolutely beautiful installation. We shut it down in the payload bay with no issues whatsoever. All of the operations while in the payload bay were perfect. Then uh, we activated it on the, the space station arm, which was a brand new activity for us. And that was also picture perfect, went exactly according to plan. Uh, a beautiful maneuver over the Sahara with a, a beautiful orange backdrop to it as we got the module in place to activate the docking system. The docking system power up was basically nominal and then uh, the, we got our first view from the docking camera itself. The crew was ahead of the head on their timeline for the day at that point so they held back because we were in a night pass and they waited for dawn and once we had optimal lighting for the final maneuver they brought MRM-1 into contact with Zarya triggered the automated docking system to begin and uh, the entire thing went exactly as, as uh, picture perfect as we could have hoped. Uh, so much so that we were missing one piece of telemetry as we were going along that one of our contact sensors did not ever actually contact because Garrett's alignment was so perfect that it didn't trip one of the contact sensors because it never actually came into contact with the docking cone. Um, Let's see, shortly after we completed the docking on the, the MRM-1 side of the interface, we got confirmation from the Russian ground site telemetry that the Zarya side of the interface had also completed its physical mate, and so we have now a, a fully permanent, redundantly uh, structurally mated module on the space station. The remainder of the day, we handed off the uh, orbital boom, orbiter boom sensor system to the shuttle arm so that it'll be available for EVA tomorrow. We uh, got that arm in a good config for the overnight and then began some preparations for the EVA spacewalk tomorrow. Uh, and then on the station side of things, we spent a lot of time basically getting our ducks in a row so that we can get some work done tomorrow as well. Tomorrow's big activity, we'll have EVA-2. Uh, we have a new task added to the beginning of that spacewalk. We'll be addressing the cable issue on the camera on the end of the boom. We will present the arm to a crew member in a, a foot restraint on the truss of the station. He will pull the cable out, tie wrap it so that it'll stay out of the way in between the connector and a, a hard stop that's where the cable's wedged right now that's preventing the camera to pan and tilt fully. That should rest restore that capability so that the camera and its sensors are available to the orbiter for inspections as required, specifically late inspections. We'll then carry on with our battery work as expected. Meanwhile, inside the station, we're gonna have a busy day as well. We're gonna be doing some uh, removal and replacement work in our oxygen generation system. Uh, some uh, maintenance there. We'll be doing some water collections and collecting samples for return to ground. Uh, so a busy day all the way around with the initiation of ingress of the MRM-1 module to top everything off. And that basically is today and tomorrow. Okay, we'll take questions uh, here in Houston and uh, we'll start off uh, in the front. Mark? Uh, Mark Corral for Aviation Week. Uh, where will you, uh, what part, which piece of truss will you do the, um, the cable tie on, do you, do you know? The uh, central part of the truss, basically S0, we have a cart set up there that already has a foot restraint installed there, so we just need, we actually do have to move it over one slot to make it slightly more accessible to the arm and get that configured, but it'll be right there at the center of the station on the way out to the P6 truss. And has there been uh, any more uh, discussion of, uh, or decision, I guess, about um, going back to the uh, the new antenna, or is that still uh, in work? Yes, this morning at the uh, at our management meeting, we were directed to increase the priority on that antenna, such that we will revisit that antenna before we go and get the grapple fixture out of the payload bay. So on EVA three. 
once the batteries are complete, the batteries are still a higher priority for us, we'll complete our battery tasks and then we'll head back up to the SGANT, the uh, space ground antenna for our backup KU system and attempt to uh, further torque down the four bolts that are holding the dish onto the boom, basically applying a greater torque on those bolts. We have a couple of steps that we can apply if that initial, we've got some backup scenarios there in case the initial attempts are not successful. Once that's complete, we'll get the launch locks off of the gimbals so that the antenna will be functional in the stage. Bill? Bill Harwood, CBS News. Um, I heard him today talk about maybe letting the station crew use the, the galley and the shuttle because of a, mm -hmm. a WPA problem. Can you tell me what's going on with that? Yeah, our uh, potable water dispenser was having a problem. Um, we think it may be a combination of two different problems. One that we've seen before, there are some mechanisms involved in getting the drink bag attached to the water dispenser and then telling the system to fill the bag with water. The, the mechanical devices that tell the system that the bag is engaged sometimes get stuck. Uh, we, we do regular cleanings of those, but we suspect perhaps uh, something's gotten clogged in there. There's an interesting signature we've not seen before in terms of some of the lights that are normally on on the front of the unit are not lit and we're going to get some more data on that from the crew either tonight or in the morning to try to psych that problem out. Right now they are able to get what we call ambient, the ambient temperature water, but they can't get hot water out of the unit. So in case they need hot water, we'll send them over to the shuttle. They've got plenty of water. It just means that we wouldn't have to dump quite as much water at the very end of the mission. And uh, But for ambient water, they can use our PWD. And the lights here on the display that you don't see illuminated, are they alarms or are they just no. simply things that are normally on that are off? They're just lights that basically indicate the availability of hot or ambient water. Okay, thanks. Robert? Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, I note on the schedule that uh, that the ingress into MRM1 is on Thursday on Flight Day 7. Um, but if I remember correctly, it's only going to be an ing uh, a brief ingress. Can you just uh, lay out what the schedule is for setting up MRM1 and when it'll be fully, when do you expect it to be fully uh, uh, set up and operational? Certainly. Um, tomorrow, actually, they'll do the initial hatch opening in order to put in the air filters and, and cleanse the air in the module. Um, they basically open the hatch, take out just enough stuff to get a filter and a fan in there, and then they close the hatch again and let the filter do its thing. Then a couple of days later, we'll open it up enough to get clamps installed. We have, in addition to the two sets of hooks holding the module to the space station right now, we also install a set of clamps that um, we'll be installing here later in the week. That's part of that ingress that you were referring to. And then beyond that, on flight day eight, um, we have the slightest amount of time to, available for some of the some beginnings of prepare, preparing for transferring the cargo out of the module. The cargo is launched on these large metal racks that are, for lack of a better way of describing it, just kind of slices through the module. You take the cargo off of one of those racks, then you get the rack out and you throw the rack away. So it's destined for the progress. And that's a somewhat time-consuming job, and the crew asked if they could start getting a, a jump on that during the docked mission. So we've made some time for them to, to begin that process, mostly because Oleg and TJ, who wanted to, to get to work on that, they'll be leaving shortly after the shuttle undocks, and they wanted to, to try to get as much of MRM-1 up and running before they left as possible. In terms of getting MRM-1, in a final configuration, our deadline for that is when we have the uh, the next Soyuz docking because it will dock to MRM-1 and we've got to get the cargo out of the way in order for the crew to make it through from the Soyuz through MRM-1 into the station. And so rather than make them dig themselves out, we're going to try to clear that path for them before they arrive. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and please correct me if I am, today was the first major use of the uh, robotic workstation in the cupola. Um, did you get any notes from the crew afterwards about how that worked, if there was any uh, additional work that needs to be done in terms of reconfiguration or if, uh, if the setup was as great as they, uh, as they anticipated it to be? Absolutely. This was, I guess it depends on what you call major. We, of course, have used it three days in a row now because we've used it every day of the docked mission so far. I, I will note one thing. Um, 
the views were apparently stunning enough that they forgot to, to have the cameras follow the module. We had to call them up and say, um, we don't have windows, so could you please move the camera so that we can actually see what's going on, or, or we are happy to do it for you. Um, I haven't gotten any comments back about the, the configuration itself. We'll certainly be asking some, some detailed questions once we begin the debriefs. At this point, we're basically looking forward more than we are looking back, and there have apparently been no problems. I'm sure they would have let us know if there were any issues. Okay, let's go to the phone bridge. A couple of reporters, Clara Moskowitz of space.com. Yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering, with the cable task that you've added to the EVA tomorrow, um, how much time has been allotted for that task, and does that mean that the overall spacewalk time has been extended at all? A good question. We are estimating that that task will take somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. We're hoping, obviously, on the, on the 20 side of things. Prior to our level one flight readiness review, our, our agency-wide uh, flight readiness review, we had 30 minutes book kept in this EVA timeline for another task, basically putting away a battery that was is going to be temporarily stowed on the truss. We, uh, through further analysis, determined that we did not need to put the battery away. So we were saving ourselves that 30 minutes in our timeline, which was giving us a better chance of getting more battery our, uh, exchanges completed during this EVA. So basically where we are by adding this task that we're allotting up to 30 minutes for at the beginning of the EVA is we're back where we were a couple of weeks ago before we eliminated that 30-minute task. Um, so we are still hopeful that we'll at least accomplish three battery exchanges between the ICC and the truss. We are willing to extend the EVA in order to try to accomplish a fourth battery exchange, which is not only getting a battery from the truss to the, uh, to the carrier, but also from the carrier to the truss. It's important to us that we, we fill the hole on the truss and not leave a, a, a gap there. Um, but beyond that, we'll just have to see. We think we're in at least the same config we were a couple of weeks ago, maybe not as good as we were a couple of days ago. Okay, and are both spacewalkers going to be working on that task? No, we'll send, Steve will stop off at the, the cart where the foot restraint is, and he will take care of that while Bueno, or Mike, will go ahead and head out to P6 and begin work on the, they each had tasks to move some foot restraints and to move some, some uh, spanners that we use during, to access the batteries. He will start that task and hopefully finish up both sets, both his and Steve's, while Steve is working on the camera. Great, thank you, that's it for me. Okay, Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Assuming that you do get the uh, cable untangled and everything is fine, um, when do you expect to add uh, an inspection um, of the shuttle? Will you try to squeeze one in? Might you even extend the mission to, so that can happen? The imagery experts are still evaluating the data that they currently have to determine whether we need to do any further inspections during the docked mission. If we are successful in regaining the camera, it is possible that the late inspection that the orbiter does after undock will be sufficient. Um, at this time, I don't have the latest in terms of the few, there were four or five spots that, that areas of the shuttle that had not been fully inspected by the Flight Day 2 inspection, that they were still uh, determining whether they needed a camera view of or not. And, um, so I think really we're kind of waiting to see if we are successful with the, the camera such that we can gain confidence that they'll get a full and complete late inspection on flight day 11 and that would um, potentially mean that we wouldn't need to get any more views. If we needed to get more views during the docked mission, we're looking at either flight day seven or flight day nine, obviously the days when we're not outside. Flight day nine perhaps has the least impact to our robotic plan, but flight day seven has some time available, so we're still weighing those options. Thank you. And um, I'm wondering, what is the thinking for why um, the antenna is not flush on the boom? It, it, could it be misaligned, or is there something with the bolts, or um, what's, what, what, what is the thinking behind that? A couple of theories. As is frequently the case when you're putting hardware together in space, a lot of it comes down to thermal properties. 
Uh, one of the, I think the leading contender in terms of theories right now is that while these are two flat plates, they do have kind of uh, guide pins inside them that, that, that help you fit it together. And that perhaps the, they were not, between the two of them, thermally equal, such that the pins were expanded greater than the holes would allow, and so that we're not able to push it all the way into the holes. And so um, if we're not able to, of course, now everything should be at uh, thermal equilibrium between the two surfaces. We should be able to go in there and uh, ratchet the, the four bolts down. If not, we're looking at pulling them out just a couple of turns and, and ratcheting them down with a, a higher torque in hopes that everything is now nice and flush and, and won't pose any issues. And, and what's plan C in case you can't uh, get a flush surface, um, then what? With the tether that we installed on EVA-1 in place, it's uh, structurally sound to the point that we don't have any concerns for the integrity of the, the antenna or the, uh, the dish coming off. And so as long as that tether is in place, that was our tie-down plan if we were unsuccessful with getting the bolts at all. And so we would leave the tether in place and try to come up with another backup plan at a later date. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions uh, back here in Houston? I think uh, that exhausts the questions, so we'll close with a few programming notes. Atlantis' uh, astronauts begin their sleep period 30 minutes earlier than previously planned uh, tonight. Bedtime will be at 5.20 p.m. Central Time. That will clear the way for the airing of our flight day highlights on NASA television beginning at 6 p.m. Central Time. Those will be replayed every hour on the hour throughout the crew's sleep period. The ISS Orbit 3 flight director, Scott Stover, who's on console as we speak, will provide his nightly update to look ahead at future activities at 11 p.m. Central Time tonight. And the wake-up call for Flight Day 6 on the shuttle station complex will be at 1.20 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday to set the stage for the second spacewalk of the flight by Steve Bowen and Mike Good, set to begin around 6.15 a.m. Central Time or earlier if the crew is running ahead of schedule. You can follow all of the work on the shuttle station complex with the two crews on our website at www.nasa.gov. With that, we'll go back to mission control and continuing coverage of the STS-132 mission. Thanks very much.